presentation. So everyone hears me well? I hope yes. everyone hears me well. Okay, so let me give you a brief introduction. I'm sure everyone is familiar with dark matter, but just uh, for the brief introduction, we know of the existence of dark matter on a very broad range of scales. And broadly speaking, across all of these scales from dwarf galaxies to galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and all the way to the largest cosmological structures, dark matter manifests itself through the fact that, that to explain the dynamics of these systems, we cannot do so by only uh, accounting for the visible matter. So for all of these systems, you need to account for an additional invisible matter to account for their dynamics. And this holds all the way to the scales of our cosmological horizon, essentially, all the way to the scales of the cosmic microwave backgrounds, uh, from which we have the most precise measurement of the amount of dark matter. So from the measurement of the temperature anisotropies from Planck, we know precisely within the percent what is the ratio of the amount of dark matter to the amount of standard matter. matter. But of course, the big question is, what is it? Okay, so we know exactly how much there is, but we still don't know what it is. And so there is a huge plethora of candidates for dark matter. And so I'm not gonna give you a, a general review, but basically classes of candidates could account, could be dark matter could be some kind of new particle in addition to the standard particles we have in the standard model. We could have some new fundamental particle. It could also be a whole family of new particles. There could be an entire dark sector uh, dark matter could also be, be made of composite particles. It doesn't have to be a fundamental particle. Their mass range could be huge. Uh, dark matter need not be even a fundamental particle or composite particle. It could be some kind of macroscopic object such as primordial black holes, something I'll talk about more in this talk. And of course it could be a combination of all these things. And of course it could also be none of any of these things that people, people have come up with. So in this talk, uh, I will focus on two very uh, specific classes of dark matter candidates, which I'll talk about later, but I will focus also on two kinds of observables about the CMB. So this talk will be focused on the cosmic microwave background. Um, so the two observables to define the jargon properly are going to be spectral distortions of the CMB and anisotropies of the CMB. So let me clarify what I mean here. So the CMB is a you know, what we have is a map of the intensity of the cosmic microwave background. So this intensity here, the specific intensity depends on frequency and on direction in the sky. We can always rewrite the specific intensity in the form of, you know, this black body function here. Now this function T here, in general, it's a function of frequency and direction in the sky. So it will have, first of all, a constant, this is what we call the monopole. This is something that does not depend on frequency and direction on the sky. So if we only have this, we would have a perfect black body with the same temperature everywhere. It will also have some uh, function that depends only on frequency, but is the same everywhere on the sky. So this would mean that the CMB is the same everywhere, is you know, homogeneous, uh, isotropic. However, it is not a perfect black body. And so this is what I mean by spectral distortions. These are deviations from a perfect black body in the frequency domain. This temperature here again could have, uh, could be a true temperature in the depend on frequency. So here it's not a true temperature, but so it could be a true temperature, but depending on the direction on the sky. So this is what we mean by anisotropies. So this would be a map of temperature anisotropies. And lastly, something I'm not gonna talk about in this talk, there can also be uh, corrections would depend both on frequency and direction. Those would be spectral and spatial distortions. An example would be the sunyaev zoldovich effect. So again, this is just to set the, uh, the stage. We're going to be talking about both spectral distortions, deviation of a black, perfect black body, uh, average over the sky, and uh, of anisotropies. So the outline of this talk, I will start by giving a very brief review of the physics underlying the spectral distortions of the CMB. And then I will give you uh, an example how this can be an observable to test properties of dark matter, specifically to test whether dark matter could scatter elastically with standard model particles. In the third part, I will give a view 
uh, of some aspects of the physics of CMB anisotropies, sp specifically uh, the importance of recombination. And then I will tell you how um, we can use CMB anisotropies to constrain primordial black holes, for instance, as a dark matter candidate. So let's start with a brief review of spectral distortions. So first, let me give you the status of observation. So the status is that in the uh, early 90s, the uh, FIRAS instrument on board COBE measured the spectrum of the CMB uh, to very high precision and showed that the CMB is indeed a perfect black body within no more than something like 10 to minus four uh, deviations. The numbers that are quoted are either a maximum amount of a Compton-wide distortion or a chemical potential distortion. And I'm gonna talk about this in a couple of slides. Now, now what I wanna point out is that this is still to date the best limits on the spectral distortions of the CMB. They date to you know, the early nineties. So there are ongoing efforts uh, to propose uh, other uh, more precise measurements of CMB spectral distortions. But as far uh, as today, there hasn't been anything that has been yet funded as far as I know. And if you're interested in this, you can reach out to Jens Kluba, who's been uh, someone who has been pushing for this for a long time. So in terms of the physics, let me just highlight the essential points. So at redshifts greater than about 2 million, which corresponds to a couple of months after the Big Bang, CMB photons can be very easily created and destroyed through uh, double Compton emission and free-free uh, radiation and, and thermalized. So what this means is that if you inject or extract any energy from the photon barium plasma at, you know, before two months after the Big Bang, it will, you will still get uh, a perfect black body spectrum after this injection. The photons will quickly thermalize. You will have creation, destruction of photons and you know, uh, re-equilibration of their energies and you will get a perfect black body, perhaps with a different temperature. So we can't have any information about what happens at such high redshifts through spectral distortions. At later time, in particular between redshift 2 million and about 60,000, photons can no longer be created and destroyed. So their number is conserved. However, their energy is very efficiently changed by uh, Thomson scattering with free electrons. So they can diffuse an energy, but you cannot make new photons very easily. As a consequence, if you inject your strategy from the photon bearing plasma, you will get an equilibrium distribution at constant photon number, which is a Bose-Einstein distribution with possibly chemical potential. This chemical potential is basically, roughly speaking, the integral over time over this epoch here, corresponding to redshifts between 60,000 and 2 million, of the fractional energy injected into the CMB relative to the energy of the photons. So this rho gamma is the energy the density of the photons, and this is the energy injected per unit time, per unit volume. Yet at later time, at redshifts less than about 60,000, one the, the photon number and the photon energy are no longer efficiently changed. So what happens is that there is a little bit of diffusion of photons, but uh, not enough to equilibrate to a uh, boson um, distribution. So if you do inject energy, for example, in the form of heating baryons, there will be a universal distortion to the uh, CMB spectrum. It is a so-called Compton-wide distortion. So it has a universal form, I'm not writing it here, but. It's a well-known universal form. You can obtain it from the component equation. And its overall amplitude, y, is obtained again by this similar integral of the fractional injection of photons uh, relative to the CMB energy density over time. And just as a point, uh, in general, if you inject energy at these red low redshifts, and if you don't inject it through heating baryons, in general, you don't have a universal distortion shape. It's only through heating that you would get this Compton-wide distortion. But in general, if you inject a line or something, uh, the CMB might be distorted in very uh, non-universal non ways. Okay, so the bottom line, and this is something that you 
can just keep for in mind if you want to even do some more to estimate of whether some process could be observable through spectral distortions. The fractional distortion, spectral distortion in the CMB is of the order of the time integral of the rate of energy injection per unit volume divided by the energy density of CMB photons at redshifts less than about 2 million. Okay. So given the fires limits, what game you can play is if you given these fires limits, you can always set a limit on whatever processes might have injected or extracted energy uh, from the photon bearing plasma at redshifts less than 2 million. So I will give you an example now on how to apply this to uh, elastic scattering dark matter. So if dark matter was some either fundamental or composite particle, one of the questions one may ask is, is it possible it might still interact a little bit with visible matter, be it photons, electrons, or baryons, okay? So by interacting, what, what would we mean? For example, dark matter could annihilate with its uh, antiparticle to photon pairs, electron positrons, quark antiquarks, et cetera. It could also decay to these particles. So those can be tested with spectral distortions of the CMB, but it turns out that their, uh, especially annihilations, are uh, much more strongly constrained by CMB anisotropies. So I will not talk about this specific process here, but I'll talk about it in the primordial black holes later on and similar. So here I'm showing the annihilation cross-section, sigma v times the velocity. And as a function of mass, this is a result from the Planck collaboration. So this is constrained uh, by CMB anisotropies and it comes from an effect on the, the ionization history, which I'll discuss later. But what I want to focus on now is another possible interaction, which is elastic scattering. Dark matter could in principle, elastic scattering, at least in the early photons, electrons or uh, nuclei. So the, especially for scattering nuclei, the uh, first thing that uh, comes to mind is direct detection experiments. So these direct detection experiments are typically underground experiments, which look for recoil, of dark matter as it scatters off some uh, noble, uh, noble gas. And so those have set some really strong limits on the dark matter cross section. But as you can see in this plot, these limits are typically limited to high enough dark matter masses because they need to be sufficiently massive as to give enough recoil to the target nuclei. And also they, all, they don't go all the way to very, uh, to relatively large cross sections because if the dark matter has too large a cross section, it would even not even reach the target. It would you know, lose its momentum before uh, reaching the detector. So this is just to highlight that uh, astrophysical and cosmological probes are scattering can be complementary to direct detection experiments by probing lower masses, as in this range, even if it's not as tight, uh, you know, as constraining, and by probing high cross sections. So now I want to discuss specifically CMB spectral distortions. So how can we test dark matter scattering from CMB spectral distortions? And this is something we proposed with Jens Kluber and Mark Minkowski uh, in 2015. So the basic idea is, is as follows. So suppose dark matter is a non-relativistic particle which scatters with either photons, electrons, or protons, any of the particles which are in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. So the scattering rate n number density of scatterers, either photons or electrons or protons. So the scattering rate per dark matter particle is n times sigma v. This goes as one plus, plus z cubed redshift, this number density. The velocity say, of baryons to, to, be, to, to make things simple goes as the temperature, uh, square root of temperature. So this is going to go as one plus z uh, square root. So this goes uh, such scales like, like, like so for a constant cross section to simplify. The Hubble rate scales as one plus z squared in radi radiation domination. So you see that the ratio of the scattering rate to the Hubble rate, which is the scattering, the number of scatterings per uh, e-fold of expansion scales as one plus z over some decoupling redshift to the three halves, roughly speaking. So what this means is that at early times, at high redshift, this is large. So dark matter is in thermal equilibrium with the plasma. And eventually at Z less than Z decoupling, it falls off of thermal equilibrium with the plasma. So pictorially, this is how the dark matter temperature evolution would look like. So this is redshift going to the right. So time you know, progresses to the left. So in blue here, I'm showing the temperature 
in a CMB, or which is also the temperature of the electrons or protons in the early universe, it goes as one plus Z, and redshift as one plus Z. So the dark matter initially is in equilibrium with them up until this decoupling redshift, at which point, because it's non-relativistic, it will start, its temperature would start falling adiabatically as one plus Z squared. So it goes one plus Z and then it falls adiabatically as one plus Z squared. So this is the general picture here that we're considering. So at these redshifts higher than the decoupling redshifts, what's going on is that the photon barium plasma is constantly giving heat to the dark matter to keep its temperature warmer than the normal adiabatic evolution. Okay, so instead of going decaying as one plus Z e squared, it decays only as one plus Z. E. So there's a constant heat transfer from photon baryons to uh, the dark matter uh, fluid, which means that the dark matter is constantly extracting heat from the photon baryon plasma. So you can calculate the quantity. So this is the same thing I was writing in the integrals before. This is the rate of energy injection per unit time per unit volume. So this is minus the rate of heating of dark matter per unit time per unit volume, okay? So, you know, you know that the energy density is three halves of number density of particles times KT, okay? And so the rate of heating is going to be the derivative of this. And here what comes in is the difference of the time evolution of the temperature minus the adiabatic time evolution. Okay, so if the dark matter was just decaying adiabatically, there's no heating. It's just the expansion of the universe. There's no heat exchange. So if you take this difference, you get the net heating. The, time, the adiabatic evolution of dark matter is when T chi goes as one plus Z squared. So the time evolution is minus two H Hubble rate times T chi. Now this temperature evolution, so at high redshift here, T chi goes as one plus Z, therefore T chi dot goes as minus H T chi, this here. And then at late time, it, the temperature just evolves adiabatically. So if I plug it, this into here, what I find is that the energy injection rate, uh, the volumetric injection rate, goes as roughly minus three halves of the number density of dark matter particles times HT before the decoupling redshift, and then falls to zero after the decoupling redshift. Of course, this is not exact. This is a, the approximation of instantaneous decoupling, which as we will see, can get things actually much more wrong that, than you might expect. Okay, so now we're gonna plug this in. We have estimated the rate of energy injection per unit volume due to this exchange of heat between photon baryon plasma and dark matter. If dark matter was to scatter with photon baryon plasma, we plug this in our estimate of the spectral distortion. And you can see that if you plug this here, you will get basically uh, some ratio of the number density of dark matter particles, which is inversely proportional to the mass of the dark matter particle to the number density of photons. So this is the dark matter to photon ratio, okay, similar to the baryon to photon ratio, times some logarithm, which depends on the decoupling redshift. Okay? Now this decoupling redshift is, depend is a function of the scattering cross section. And in fact, also a function of the mass of the dark matter as it is obtained from setting the scattering rate equal to the Hubble rate, okay? So basically the spectral distortion here you see is a function of the mass of the dark matter and of its scattering cross section through this decoupling redshift. So by saying that fire has observed a spectral distortion which is no more than 10 minus four, one can therefore set a limit on the cross section of dark matter with photons or electrons or baryons depending on its mass. Okay, so this is what we did in this first paper with Jens Klub and Mark Yankowski. So those are actual limits on the dark matter proton cross-section, dark matter electron cross-section, dark matter photon cross-section from existing data from the early nineties. Okay, so those were limits that could, you know, could just have been derived uh, 30 years ago, but we did this for the first time in this paper from the FIRAS data. They're not very good limits, but nevertheless, they are uh, limits. And in some cases, they're better limits than uh, than what was there before. For example, dark matter electron uh, scattering is probed by uh, xenon uh, 10, but only for heavy dark matter. And so here we could probe lighter dark matter. Now, as I said before, this is all done in the instantaneous decoupling approximation. Nevertheless, this is a very rough approximation. 
So why did we make this approximation? So as long as dark matter can scatter with itself, or if it scatters efficiently with baryons, it will have a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of velocities, and, and then we can describe it by a temperature. Okay, so we only need to solve about t for the evolution of TK. This is what I was giving the argument for. I was explaining terms and things in terms of the dark matter the temperature. But in general, if dark matter stops interacting with the thermal fluid of baryons, okay, and if dark matter is not self interacting strongly, it doesn't have to have a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. When it decouples from baryons, it will also develop very strong distortions away from Maxwell Boltzmann. So at the time, we didn't have a treatment of you know, these distortions of the dark matter velocity distribution. And so it seemed to be rather accurate to simply uh, make a, this instantaneous decoupling approximation. Now, what I checked a couple of years ago is that if you calculate more accurately, the evolution of the dark matter distribution, velocity distribution, assuming it doesn't self-interact. So this is the extreme case where it would develop uh, deviations uh, from Maxwell Boltzmann. Okay, so this is as a function of dark matter velocity, the deviation of its velocity distribution away from the Gaussian distribution, the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So I calculated this making some uh, 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 Fokker-Planck approximations and diffusion approximation to the collision operator something which one of my students is checking now. And then I calculated the dimensionless, the, the heat exchange rate between photon baryon plasma and dark matter. And what I found is that the heat exchange rate uh, is off by at most a factor of two if you assume Maxwell Boltzmann distribution or if you actually calculate the evolution of the dark matter distribution at the time. So this means that you know one must keep in mind that making the Maxwell Boltzmann approximation gives you errors of factors of two at most and that it uh, it to, to make things more accurate one would need to account for this but if you're willing to deal with errors of factor of two it's fine so uh, to estimate the correct spectral distortions within order unity you know factors of two accuracy what one has to do is instead of just doing this instantaneous decoupling approximation is really solve for the evolution of the dark matter temperature so this, if, if the right-hand side was zero, dark matter would just evolve adiabatically. This is accounting for the coupling of dark matter with the photon baryon plasma, with the heat exchange of, with the photon baryon plasma. And it accounts for scattering of dark matter with photons, electrons, protons, or e even helium nuclei, okay? So once you solve for this differential equation for the dark matter temperature by plugging in the appropriate rates, which depends on the interaction of dark matter, then you can calculate the energy injection rate, which is basically this right-hand side term. So I did this uh, last year, and I realized that, in fact, the instantaneous decoupling approximation can be very, very wrong. And this is because even after the official time of decoupling, there can still be sufficient residual heat exchange between dark matter and photons. And if the dark matter is sufficiently light, and, and, and if you consider sufficient, sufficiently precise experiments, this, this can completely dominate uh, the effect. So the dashed lines here are uh, the sensitivity to dark matter proton cross-section as a function of mass. So the dashed lines are the sensitivity if you make this instantaneous decoupling approximation that we did in our 2015 paper and the solid lines as if you, what you get if you properly solve for the evolution of the dark matter temperature. And you see that we were completely, uh, we were too pessimistic in terms of how uh, low a crop can probe. Luckily, it went in the correct direction. So I implement this, implemented this here, and here I'm showing you either the constraints from FireS, so in solid red, or the forecasted sensitivity of future uh, spectral distortion experiments to the cross-section of dark matter, either with protons or with electrons, assuming either it scales as one over V squared or it's a constant cross section. Okay, so the general features of this plot is that, for example, if we look on the right, 
at high enough masses, um, direct detection experiments constrain dark matter scattering with electrons. But as I said before, they typically don't constrain low masses. And so uh, future experiments for spectral distortions could in principle probe some region of parameter space, which is not necessarily probed otherwise. Uh, for protons, you see that you have uh, also, you can be probing by CMB anisotropies or Lyman alpha forests. But for sufficiently uh, sensitive spectral distortion experiments, you could in principle improve on these limits. So uh, to give a little bit more of a realistic model, I checked what happens for a dark matter, which has say an electric or magnetic dipole moment. So in this case, from a single parameter, for example, the electric dipole moment, one can compute the cross section for annihilation into photons or leptons, anti-leptons, for scatterings with photons and electron nuclei. Okay, so all of these cross sections are parameterized by a single parameter. So rather than saying, oh, let me take this fictitious dark matter model that only scatters with protons or only with electrons, here I'm taking something that's somewhat more realistic of some microphysical model of dark matter and accounting for all of these processes simultaneously. So if you account for all these processes simultaneously, they all contribute to uh, the limits uh, on this coupling parameter, basically the dipole moment of dark matter as a function of mass. So you can, in, in low masses, uh, elastic scattering dominates the, uh, the limits, and then you have annihilations that dominate the limits at high masses, and it depends whether it's electric or magnetic dipole moments. However, if you put in on a plot other limits that exist, each one of them is probing a different uh, effect. For example, xenon 10 is probing dark matter electron scattering. Okay. Uh, here you have CMB anisotropy limits on dark matter annihilation. Okay. So it turns out that for this specific model, spectral distortions would never do better, even if you have a really sensitive spe spectral distortion experiment, would never do better than whatever is the best existing limit on the dark matter electric or magnetic dipole moment, okay? So this, for my sort of uh, view on spectral distortions as a probe of dark matter, I'm not extremely optimistic because of this, you know, little calculation I've done here, but this doesn't prove that spectral distortions would not ever be useful for testing dark matter uh, scattering or annihilation. So I think that for every single, and it's easy enough to, you know, do the calculation and to make it even easier, what I've done is I've released this code publicly. So this code can allow you to reproduce these calculations in this paper. So basically if you provide the code with some parameterization of dark matter interactions, so through its annihilation rates, a cross section, through photons uh, and to electron positrons, through a scattering rate with uh, protons, electrons and photons and with the proper uh, energy or velocity dependence, then this code will calculate the spectral distortions and you can even extract uh, limits from FIRES or make forecasts of sensitivity for different spectral distortion, distortion experiments. So I think spectral distortion should always be thought about as something that complements whatever other uh, particle physics or cosmological limits uh, exist. All right. I will move on to the next part. I don't know if you want to ask questions in the middle or if we just leave them for the end, because now I'm going to talk about CMB anisotropies. Fabio, should I just keep going? Sure. I think we can okay. have questions at the end. OK. So this first part was about deviations from of the perfect black body spectrum away you know, from uh, of the CMB frequency spectrum, average over, all over the sky away from a perfect black body. Now I'm going to talk about CMB anisotropies, which probably people think a little bit more about because this is something that has been measured many times uh, since COBE. Okay, so as a brief overview of the one piece of the underlying physics, in the first 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the rate of Thomson scattering is much larger than the rate of expansion. And as a consequence, photons and electrons, protons, photons and baryons are tightly coupled. They form a fluid with a very high pressure. And so if we have some initial uh, density perturbation in this fluid, and then you release it, it will undergo acoustic oscillations, just sound waves, as I'm highlighting here uh, in this uh, you know, 
pictorial representation. So these sound waves are going to go on for about 400,000 years, after which photons will travel freely and baryons will start clustering under gravity. We can see this in a little bit different way. So here, if I show, show the evolution as a function of time, you know, temperature decreases with time. The universe is initially ionized, and then eventually you form uh, the first neutral hydrogen atoms. So as photons travel through this, as I said, because the Thomson scattering rate is much greater than expansion rate, that means that photons can scatter many times per expansion e-fold, up until roughly around 400,000 years, at which point they scatter basically for one last time. This is the last scattering epoch, and then travel all the way to us, all right? So just to put things in context, they travel all the way to us, through the first stars, et cetera, through the expanding and evolving universe. And from our point of view, we are at the center of our observable universe. And so we see these photons coming from a last scattering surface all around us. And this is the surface of the CMB. So what we see in terms of the CMB maps, what you see is basically the last snapshot of these photon baryon oscillations that I was talking about, okay? So photons and baryons oscillate together. In the meantime, photons, if you think of them just like these uh, photon particles, they're scattering, scattering until the moment where they scatter for the last time. And what you get then is a map of the last snapshot of these photon baryon oscillations. All right. By measuring the power spectrum uh, so the variance of CMB temperature or polarization uh, fluctuations as a function of angular scale. So this is basically the, this multiple moment is basically an inverse angular scale, large L correspond to small angular scales. One can compare with uh, our theoretical models, which is a very well understood and simple theoretical model, simple in the sense that it's well understood physics. And we can extract various cosmological parameters from it. For example, this is from this that we can know very precisely to within a percent, the amount of dark matter. And you cannot fit this data if you don't put in dark matter. Simply put, if you try to do, do so, you, you would just get a really absolutely horrible fit. You need to have dark matter to fit uh, these different power spectrum. So, one thing I want to emphasize is that the CMB and SRP power spectra are extremely sensitive to the way that the universe went from being fully ionized to neutral. Okay, this determines when these baryon photon oscillations would, will stop, well, when photons will decouple from uh, baryons, and when photons scatter for the last time. So more quantitatively, they are very sensitive to this function here, which is the ionization fraction as a function of time. So one of the things I worked on for my PhD thesis and I've been working on more recently with my student Anum is to calculate this ionization history very precisely. So I want to just give you a visual illustration that if you mess up the calculation, so here I'm putting a large bump here in XC, I'm gonna move this bump and you're gonna see how it changes the theoretical temperature and polarization power spectra. Okay, so the point I wanna make is that if you had some errors in XC, or conversely, if some physical process changed your ionization fraction, this would have an effect on the temperature and polarization power spectrum. So to make sure that we know XE, the ionization fraction very well, this is, as I said, something I worked on with Chris Rata for my, PhD, for my PhD thesis, and we produced this code HIREC, Jens Kluba uh, and collaborators also produced an equivalent code COSMOREC. They both, give you XE within uh, ten, one part and uh, a few parts in 10,000 accuracy, and they run about one second per cosmology. And last year, my student Nanum Lee made a new version of HIREC, which in a very intelligent way uses some fitting functions, some correction functions to account for various processes which are encountered numerically in HIREC. And we managed to do so still by keeping exactly the same accuracy, but now running in one millisecond for cosmology. So now this is the fastest recombination code uh, in the East and the West. So let me talk now for the last, whatever, 10 minutes or so uh, about uh, how one can use the sensitivity of CMB and isotropies to recombination to probe accreting primordial black holes. So first, uh, 
a brief introduction to primordial black holes. Okay. So before I talked about dark matter particles uh, as a candidate, now what about this primordial black hole business? So here's the idea. So we know from, so this is showing the RMS initial curvature perturbation as a function of co-moving scale. From CMB and ISRP's large scale structure measurement, we have basically measured almost, you could say directly, the amplitude of this RMS curvature perturbation on say megaparsec to gigaparsec scales. We asked from the simplest model of inflation, we have this primordial uh, power spectrum should be almost scale invariant over 15 to 25 decades. However, we don't really have any measurements down here. We have some upper limits from spectral distortions. This would, if, this would dissipate power through uh, silk damping, but we don't have any idea of the amplitude here. Okay? And in particular, there could be some large in principle, somewhat large uh, fluctuations. So now if you have some large amplitude perturbations on very small scales, they could, if they're large enough, they could collapse directly and form black holes. The black hole mass is related to the moving scale through this optimistic equation. So primordial black holes, this would be primordial black holes, they would be a perfect dark matter candidate because you know they're black holes, they uh, interact very little with light and on cosmological scales or you know galaxy scales, it doesn't matter if dark matter is made of uh, electron mass things or of solar mass things. And in addition, they're interesting because they also give us some kind of window into the initial conditions of the universe on very small scales. There are lots of limits on the fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes, this FPBH, which is at most one as a function of solar of mass of the primordial black hole. So there are many limits ranging from limits due to uh, Hawking evaporation, microlensing, gravitational waves on which I've worked, but I won't discuss in this talk, and CMB anisotropy. Now, these limits are assuming a delta function mass distribution, but you could have extended mass distributions. For example, if you look at this one proposed by these authors, it could peak in this window where uh, there are basically no constraints, but it could also have a little bump here. So for these reasons, I think it's interesting to explore these regions, even if, if you take this at face value, it tells you, okay, primordial black holes cannot make 100% of the dark matter here, end of the story. But it's not the end of the story. If you can get much better limits here, you could probe extended mass functions that peak at much lower mass. Okay? So I think it's interesting to still uh, get better limits in this region from one to a thousand solar masses where we have limits, but they're not extremely tight. And so I will briefly, so I've worked on these limits from LIGO, but what I'm going to briefly discuss are these CMB and isotropy limits. So here's the story. Suppose that part of, part of the dark matter is made of black holes okay, in the early universe. So these black holes are in the primordial gas. They're going to create. So the first part of the theoretical calculation is to estimate how much gas they create. And so they're, it's not quite the usual bondi hoyle tilton uh, accretion rate because they are creating gas in, a, in an environment that has lots of photons, which can come to Compton cool and exert Compton drag on uh, the accreted gas. Then this gas will produce some kind of uh, radiation as it's accreted. Uh, so at minimum, at minimum, as the gas is getting heated up and getting ionized as it falls onto the black hole, at very minimum, it will emit radiation. So if you want to be conservative, which is what we did in our work, we only accounted for this free free radiation, which we can compute from first principles. But in principle, you could also have an accretion disk, for example, which could be much more luminous than this. Um, then the next part is to convert how the energy, which is you know, radiated away by this black hole, so this energy which is injected into the plasma, how does it actually interact with the plasma? How does it deposit itself into the plasma, and this can happen with some time delay um, in the form of additional ionizations to the plasma. And lastly, once you do this, this will have an effect on the ionization history. So in, you, you have all these photons, uh, high energy photons from um, black holes, which can heat up the plasma, and they can also lead to additional ionizations. So they can perturb this Xe, this free electron fraction, 
they can increase it as a function of time. Therefore, they will delay the moment of last scattering and they will, they will therefore uh, change uh, the CMB and isotropy power spectra. So in a way that can be calculable, so this is the change in CMB and isotropy power spectra for say primordial black holes with uh, of 100 solar masses and making all of the dark matter or 10,000 solar masses and making a small fraction of the dark matter. Okay, so this is qualitatively the same effect as what I was describing here. Okay, instead of adding a bump to the free action fraction, we're adding some, you know, well, uh, I mean, calculated function. I don't know if it's well known. There are lots of theoretical uncertainties, but you can calculate this function that you're adding, and this will lead to some effect on CMB temperature uh, and polarization power spectra, which then you compare to the plank, to Planck data, and you can use it to try to measure or constrain the fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes. So this is how, in this paper with Mark Minkowski, I derived the derivative upper limits on the fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes. And the upper limit tells you that primordial black holes cannot make all of the dark matter if their masses is above about 100 solar masses. But this other curve is just to show you the uh, theoretical uncertainty. We, we uh, made two assumptions about uh, the, uh, the ionization structure, basically, of the accreting gas on the black hole, and you get very different luminosities in the two assumptions. So this is just to give you an idea of the theoretical uncertainty, uh, which is about two orders of magnitude. Hello. Hello. Yes. yes. I think I got disconnected. Not sure um, how far we're hearing. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you, you heard me when I was saying about I was discussing this plot. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think I should be done in. Less than five minutes, if that's okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to briefly mention some work in progress with one of my students. Um, something actually we've been working on for like three years or more. So the work in progress, so these limits I was showing are based on the power spectrum of CMB and isotropies. So if you assume that the temperature and polarization fluctuations are perfectly Gaussian, they're completely described by their uh, power spectrum. Okay. But as I'm going to argue here, accreting primordial black holes should actually leave non-Gaussian signatures, which I think should be much more constraining. So here's the idea. So the rate at which gas, and therefore the luminosity of these black holes, depend rather strongly on the velocity of the gas relative to the black hole. So the black hole is not sitting in some perfectly still gas of baryons, these baryons have relative motions with respect to the dark matter, even if at very large linear scales. And this is simply because in the early universe, baryons undergo these acoustic oscillations, whereas dark matter already starts falling into potential wells. So these typical relative velocities here, they are typically supersonic. So the RMS relative velocity is typically five times the typical sound speed. And this was shown by Tseliakovich and Hirata. And this is something, again, you can compute just from linear theory. You can just take your favorite Boltzmann code, and you can calculate this V relative. And its RMS is about five times the sound speed at recombination. So, so this means that this function, the accretion rates, and therefore the black hole are going to be very strongly varying functions. And this should be a three halves, actually, of the relative velocity. So pictorially, this is showing you the relative velocity between baryons and dark matter, whether it's made of black holes or anything else. And so you see that there are these large scale fluctuations of relative velocity. And typically this relative velocity has an RMS of about 30 kilometers per second at recombination. In contrast, the sound speed is about five kilometers per second, five to six kilometers per second at recombination. So if I plug in this formula that I wrote before, it will show you that the luminosity, estimated luminosity of black holes is very large has these high peaks in regions where you have low relative velocity and it's very small almost everywhere else. Okay, So the picture is that the luminosity of these black holes is highly inhomogeneous. Okay, So again, 
I'm just showing this here. These in these fluctuations in relative velocity leads to a very inhomogeneous accretion luminosity of black holes. And therefore, this would lead to an inhomogeneous injection of energy into the plasma, and this should therefore lead to an inhomogeneous effect on the ionization history. So if I write this Xe, this free electron fraction, as some standard value, which, for example, Hyrek calculates, plus some perturbations, what I'm saying in equations is that these perturbations, they have a uniform piece, okay, plus some spatially varying piece. And what I'm saying is that the spatially varying piece is of the same order as this uniform piece. Now, given for the, the CMB power spectrum limits I derived and I showed you before, they only come from this uniform piece. This is what matters for the CMB power spectrum. And you can translate, so if you saturate the CMB upper limits, basically it tells you that this uniform perturbation is no more than about 1% percent standard uh, free electron fraction. So this means that this spatial piece, this delta Xe, also is about 1% of the standard free electron fraction. So the picture is that we expect that there should be 1% spatial fluctuations of the ionization history. Now, the key is that spatial fluctuations in the ionization fraction are known to lead to CMB non-Gaussianities. And this was calculated, for example, in the standard, you know, no accreting parameter black holes, just in the standard vanilla lambda CDM model, just because of no, the linear evolution of uh, the free electron fraction, you get fluctuations of, of about 10 to the minus four around recombination. And it was calculated by various, uh, in various papers that this leads to a, a non-Gaussian signature that is almost observable by Planck, okay? A signal to noise of about 0.5. So what I was telling you before is that I expect that if I saturate the CMB power spectrum limit with the parameter black hole abundance, I would get a spatial fluctuation of about 10 minus two, meaning about a hundred times larger than this, okay? So therefore I expect Planck through measurement of non-Gaussianities to be sensitive to a fraction that is about a hundred times smaller than the limits that I get from power spectrum. So this is just some reasoning. You can rewatch the video and do it <laughs> at your own pace if it's, uh, this is better with a blackboard, but it's a very simple reasoning to argue that this non sanity should be very sensitive, hundred times more sensitive than the power spectrum. And so this, what we've been looking at with my student trade and the first thing is to ask, okay, it's one thing that you have inhomogeneous energy injection, but perhaps the energy gets deposited far away from the black holes and so, you start with something highly inhomogeneous, but then the process of energy deposition smooths th things out. And so what traded is to calculate the Green's function, the response between the, the relation between energy deposition and energy injection. Not only as a function of time, which is something that, for example, Tracy Slatcher has done and we have reproduced her results, but also as a function of scale, as a function of distance from the injection point. And traded this by implementing some radiation transport simulations, and we have also some new analytic results, uh, basically improving on some of Tracy's Slatcher's calculations in the specific cases we've considered. So our results, which are temporary results, is that uh, indeed there are order uh, the same order in spatial fluctuations as the mean effect, and that these spatial fluctuations in the free electron fraction peak around k of 0.1 inverse megaparsecs which is comparable to CMB and SLTRP scales. So in words, I do expect that there should be some significant effect on CMB non-Gaussianities. And what we're doing now with my student, Trey, is to compute the CMB tri-spectrum. So this is a horrendous calculation, but we're hoping to be done within, you know, uh, before summer. I will leave you with just one slide as an epilogue, which has nothing to do with the CMB, but just to advertise the work that my former postdoc, Derek Inman did, which is a completely different question, which is how do primordial black holes cluster? And what Derek did is to implement simulations of primordial black holes plus particle dark matter. And what I just want to point out is that if the universe contained primordial black holes, even in some fraction, which is not 100%, it would have a dramatic effect on the evolution of structure formation on very small scales. And I will just 
leave you with this cool video and uh, take questions. So this is a video of the simulations of these primordial black holes as they form structures as early as redshift of a few hundred. So I'll, st I'll stop here.